Henry Poincaré. Remember Poincaré's conjecture from the last part? He tells us a rather morbid tale of a man walking down the street, getting killed because a roofer accidentally drops a brick. Had the man been there a few seconds later, or a few seconds earlier for that matter, he would have lived and he would have survived, only to perhaps become a serial killer. Then it wouldn't be so good. But maybe if he had survived, he would have become a philanthropist and would have touched thousands of lives for the better. So bad things happen all the time in this world of happenstance, or good things, depends how we look at them. The fact of the matter is that small changes in events at one time can cause major changes at a later stage. Since the time of Newton, our vision of the universe has been that of a giant complex clock and there are invisible gears and springs and they interact with each other and work in perfect harmony and are predictable. The job of science is to explore the mechanics behind it and be able to predict things. As put by Laplace, we may regard the present state of the universe as the effect of its past and the cause of its future. Instead of finding ways to be able to predict the, the universe more and more, science discovered systems for which it is humanly impossible to predict the future. Such impossibly unpredictable systems are called chaotic systems. Chaos is a Greek word which means disorder. Cosmos is another Greek word which means order, so disorder in an order universe. The opposite of chaotic systems are called stable systems. The difference between both is that we're able to make accurate predictions about stable systems but cannot make any sort of predictions or long-term predictions for chaotic systems. So it's chaos versus order or determinism versus randomness that we're dealing with here. Edward Lawrence, a mathematician and a meteorologist, while analyzing weather patterns via computer simulations, lethargically omitted two places of decimals from an input and found out that the resulting weather pattern was completely different from what he had expected. This in turn essentially made him write a book which is called Predictability Does the Flap of a Butterfly's Wings in Brazil Set Off a Tornado in Texas? Not a very concise name, I agree, but it tells us that sensitive dependence on initial conditions is a property of chaotic systems. The effect is popularly known as the butterfly effect. Weather systems is just one example of chaotic systems. We have fluid dynamics, traffics and how vehicles move, economics of countries, trade markets. These are all chaotic systems. The exploration forces us to acknowledge and respect the difference between determinism and predictability. Um, yes, we can write equations and formulas that accurately describe the actions, but we cannot use those equations and formulas to make any long-term predictions. We just simply cannot keep track of all the butterflies and their flapping wings. We know how a simple pendulum behaves. There are formulas and equations pretty much covering everything there is the phenomenon. Attach another pendulum to the system and it becomes chaotic. Good luck with replicating the exact behavior twice. It requires infinite precision that human beings are not simply capable of. So there's nothing in science essentially which could predict the behavior of a chaotic system. Speaking of science, as we have been exploring a myriad of different ways human beings make use of reason, Science fundamentally suffers from an inherent flaw. It's called the problem of induction. Why must one believe that if every swan ever seen is white, then all the swans are white? The problem asks, what right do we have to generalize from our few observations to a universal law? There is no logical reason for us to believe that if the sun has shone in the sky every day for the past thousands of years and has been observed by us and our ancestors, that the sun will again shine tomorrow. Nothing in our lives is devoid of induction, however. We turn on the light, expecting that it will make the room brighter. We turn a faucet and expect that water shall flow out of it. If we stand outside in the rain, we will get drenched. We are constantly making judgments and conclusions from a rather limited set of observations. Just knowing something has happened in the past does not guarantee that it will happen again. But we do not second guess these things. So are we being really logical here. One of the leading figures in philosophy of science in the 20th century, Karl Popper, believed there is no solution to the problem of induction. According to him, scientists must not try to verify laws made by human beings via induction. Rather, these conjectures 
should shown to be wrong or in his words falsifiable but induction does seem to work i mean the sun did come out today and we could bat our heads it will show up again tomorrow but the argument is circular in nature and that's a problem because we're looking for reasons to believe in induction by saying induction has worked in the past so induction will always work so we're using induction to justify induction if something works in such a way then it cannot be declared reasonable it has flaws and must not be taken as the representative of the final mode of reality consider the following all ravens are black every time you see a raven that is black you're essentially confirming this statement less established this as a true fact and even though we know that we haven't and probably cannot see and observe all the ravens in the world let's just agree that all the ravens are black but think of an apple now an apple is not black because of the truth of the statement that we have established this non black object which happens to be an apple is definitely not a raven we are led to the following two statements which are logically equivalent all ravens are black all non black objects are non ravens if we confirm one we automatically confirm the other as well on the other hand if we do see a non black raven then we falsify both statements imagine a green car now a green car is not black so it's also not a raven clearly every time we see a green car we are confirming the second statement all non black objects are non ravens which we have seen is logically equivalent to the first statement that is all ravens are black which is super weird because now we're using our reason to prove every time we see a green car that all ravens are black and it gets weirder every time we see a green car we're also confirming the following statement all non blue objects are non ravens because a green car is non blue and it's also not a raven so the green non blue object is a car not a raven which is equivalent to all ravens are blue so essentially by just looking at a green car we're confirming that all ravens are black and also blue we could pretty much have an infinite number of logically correct statements about the world just by observing a green car inductive reasoning lies at the core of scientific method inductive reasoning is problematic this however does not mean that induction does not work or does not produce results we only need to take it as a probabilistic tool we certainly cannot prove by any means the sun will shine tomorrow but we can predict with a very very high probability that it will scientific method at best is probabilistic not certain moving on we're all familiar with the statement that does the theory have the math to prove it which raises an important question about the nature of reality and our understanding of it and the relationship with mathematics now in order to comprehensively understand reality do we really require mathematics or there are other ways too english physicist paul dirac wrote about the mathematical nature of the universe as you may wonder why is nature constructed along these lines one can only answer that our present knowledge seems that it is so constructed we simply have to accept it in year 1960 the physicist eugene wigner published an important paper titled the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics in natural sciences in which he raised many important pertinent questions about the relationship of mathematics and natural science but he did not come to any definitive answer and concluded by saying the enormous usefulness of mathematics in natural science is bordering on the mysterious and there is no rational explanation for it albert einstein wrote an enigma presents itself how can it be that mathematics after all a product of human thought which is independent of experience is so admirably appropriate to the object of reality while mentioning the relationship between mathematics and physical science it is only fair to assess whether mathematics does in fact provide a flawless tool to further any investigation into the nature of reality we mentioned kurt gödel briefly when we discussed the concept of infinity but we did not discuss his incompleteness theorem which we still won't because it requires a video series of its own but for now the following should suffice any axiomatic system such as mathematics and logic there are true statements that cannot be proven therefore the system is not complete if a system is made to be complete 
then it must be consistent. So there is a trade-off between completeness and consistency. Yikes. In other words, for any system which relies on, on fundamental assumptions that must be accepted as true, there will always be questions that cannot be answered. And any such system cannot prove its own consistency. So mathematics essentially, and logic also, can either be complete, that is, they cover all the possible aspects and cases, or they can be consistent, that is, they ensure they don't produce contradictions, but never both. All our sure statements about the nature of the world are mathematical statements, and yet we do not know what mathematics is, and so we find that we have adapted a religion strikingly similar to many traditional faiths. Change mathematics to God, a little else that seemed to change. John Barrow. We briefly touched upon the nature of space and time in our journey and glanced upon how we're still not able to find out whether space is discrete or continuous. There seems to be some hope there. The so-called theory of everything lurks just at arm's length and now we can almost grab it. The string theory shall unite quantum mechanics and relativity theory finally, according to which the basic building blocks of the universe are minute wiggling strings. Uh, these strings move and rattle and roll while combining and separating to make up all the quarks, the protons and electrons, and all the particles of everyday life. This theory can be used to describe all the forces of quantum mechanics and relativity. There is just one little problem with it. There is no empirical evidence that shows the theory to be correct. It's a beautiful theory, but it's just a theory, just like Darwinian natural selection. In the words of Karl Popper, I've come to the conclusion that Darwinism is not a testable scientific theory, but a metaphysical research program. It is astonishing that for some reason, the air of mystery around Darwinian natural selection has been removed and it has become akin to a proven fact and the most fundamental truth of human biological history. Whereas it is as untestable as phrenology, eugenics or astrology. It is quite interesting that it was a complete science and a reasonable fact that human beings were born with different skull shapes which reflected their intelligence, taste, abilities and helped deduce their overall cognitive performance. Developed by the German physician Franz Joseph Gall, the discipline was known as phrenology. It helped deduce that Caucasians were a superior race based on the craniometry of their heads. Yeah, they had words and everything. Eugenics was an advanced science also, and supposedly the best way forward for humanity at the time. Some called it the savior of humanity because there was no room for the feeble-minded and weak human beings in progressive societies, and they had to be exterminated. An application of which was readily undertaken in America in the late 19th century, and of course, in a certain Nazi Germany. Slavery and colonization were completely fair undertakings, and to some the only way to preserve the weaker races. How can reason fail us then? And time and time again, it has wreaked havoc, caused wars and massacres, decimated cities, exterminated races in the name of betterment, science, and the greater good. Isn't that exactly the same as atrocities committed in the name of religion? Why is only religion then outdated and tainted with the blood of millions, but not rationality and science? If religious zeal and dogma is a concept of the past, where human beings had not discovered better ways of conducting themselves, then what is the justification for non-religious dogmatic fascism? What explains the fact that it was completely reasonable and politically correct to slowly starve to death 7 million Ukrainians in Soviet Russia? Why did the modern man succumb to bombing twin cities in Japan? According to which faculty of reason or merits of nobility did the English have the right to subjugate, oppress and plunder millions of Indians and call it fair? Was it driven by rationality or greed? But isn't greed a perfectly rational thing to do? Is it moral or not? Is it is a different thing? Why do human beings continue to kill and pillage even though this is supposedly the most civilized of times? Should we then be more rationally steadfast or 
emotionally stable. Why are some theories elevated to undisputed status of unquestionable truth, whereas others don't? Phrenology didn't last because it was pseudoscience, but statistics continues to be utilized in decision making widely, even though it is also a pseudoscience. Astrology is dead because it was pseudoscience and could not be proven, but psychology isn't. Both cannot be proven, by the way, or falsified. Then why does one last and not the other? We have explored, analyzed, and ventured through different terrains of human reasoning. We have seen how something as fundamental as our language has basic challenges and pitfalls that we must avoid. We have seen that how self-referencing is an issue across different disciplines. We explored infinity, mathematics, and computing, and all for what? What is the conclusion that we can take home from, from all of this? The problem certainly is not reason, but our application of it and the pedestal that we have placed it on. We use what helps us achieve our goals and discard everything else. Our voluntary surrender to the gods of reason and rationality must be scrutinized as much as our bowing down to any god. Reason is as fallible as the heart. Sometimes the gut feeling yields better results than hard facts. Reason is a tremendous faculty and at times pretty much the only faculty which makes us who we are, but our lives are primarily driven by emotions, and yet we are still very distant from acknowledging it emotionally. We would like to believe that 21st century man is a rational and informed being and objective in nature, and yet when someone questions that we get angry, resentful and offended, which are emotions and not calculations. At any given point in time, any scientific explanation of physical phenomena is at the same risk of being rejected as any metaphysical view. The homunculus was a fully formed person inside a germ cell which grew up at the time of fertilization and became a fully functional human being. It was a legit enlightenment era microbiology. The world moved on from a geocentric universe to a heliocentric one. There was Newtonian ether surrounding us and then there was no ether and now we have the Higgs field. But you might tell me what we have done over the course of the last five videos or so is to use our reason to pretty much deconstruct reason and that would be 100% correct. Reason is not a problem but its utmost supremacy is. Clearly it has a place when it exceeds its bounds, problems arise. So is it fair or even reasonable to decide we don't need a source of morality anymore as we have come far enough to cherry pick based on historical evidences and our utilitarian natures. It's a problem when reason is arm twisted into uttering a forced cry that there is no evidence for the existence of God. If that's the case then there is nothing which is forbidden essentially and everything is permitted. Eugenics, phrenology, bombing the twin cities in Japan or starving 7 million Ukrainians in Soviet Russia. But that thing which tells us that surely that cannot be true must be taken seriously as well. Our experiences are not a result of calculations. We don't calculate how much we love someone. Our preferences are mostly not rational. We don't do technical analysis before we buy a pair of shoes. Or we don't read statistical data on how humans have historically felt about the taste of chocolate chip cookies. Our consciousness is a product of an infinite number of variables. We are complex and intricate. We laugh so hard we cry. We run so fast we fall. We fall so hard we stand back up. We outgrow pain. We outlast hatred. We are more than the sum of our parts. When we reduce human beings to processes, chemicals and gases, we have shown we are very darn capable of guessing them dead in chambers. Thank you for watching. I'll see you with a brand new topic soon. Until then, I'm going to quote the definitely wise philosopher and poet Dr. Iqbal and take your leave. Reason is but a wayside lamp that gives eyes to the wayfarer on a dark night. But what does this lamp on the wayside know about the storms raging in the house?